I'm here with mm. Ahara Davis, nice one brother. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for taking the time out, I'm honoured. I'm a big boxing fan. Mm -hmm. I'm a boxer myself, but not, not a pro. And when I had the opportunity to speak to mm -hmm. real pros mm -hmm. who are living kind of the dream I wanted to live, yeah. it's, just, it's just such a flattening thing, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for taking the time out. Anytime, yeah. Right, we are, I just want to make sure I got this right, at Essex Fight Academy. I'm here with mm -hmm. Ahara Davis, nice one brother. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for taking the time out, I'm honoured. Anytime. I'm a big, um, I'm a big boxing fan. Mm -hmm. I'm a boxer myself, but not, not a pro. Mm -hmm. um, and when I had the opportunity to speak to mm -hmm. real pros mm -hmm. who are living kind of the dream I wanted to live, yeah. it's, just, it's just such a flattening thing, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for taking the time out. Anytime, yeah. Um, Shout out to Luke as well, because uh, he hooked this up and I'm here with Mimbo, so, um, who's made this happen as well. So um, yeah, I hope we get a lot of value out of this. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I, I reached out to Luke and mm -hmm. then to you to get you on the podcast is because I have, I'm a co-founder of a wellness company called Mimboso, which mm -hmm. Chris is a part of. Um, mm -hmm. Mimboso is anything from like, mental health, mindset, mm. uh, business, investing, mm. training, boxing, uh, nutrition, it's the whole mm. package. And I've been following you for actually a few years and I yeah. thought, you know what, you tick, you tick mm. the bill, you've got confidence, you're a boxer, you're fit. Mm. Um, and I think that you're, you're driven, you know, mm -hmm. you, want, you want more out of your career. Yeah. So just for the viewers that maybe need to know you or mm. kind of know you, mm. what is your background? How'd you start? How did I get into boxing? Yeah, uh, I got into boxing. I was in a youth club. I okay. remember that time I was on bail. You know, drugs, a few other things. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't on a good path. Um, I used to go to a certain youth club, and then they had a boxing coach. He used to come in every <coughs> Wednesday. He used to, like you know, he's like he'll come in, and he will come in. Uh, you know, and he'll bring gloves and he'll bring pads and he'll take us on the pads, um, and stuff like that. And then I was like, the first time I was there, I was like, boxing there, nah. but then a person in that club said it, I forgot who it was, but they said, listen, just go, just go. So I went there, I put on gloves, I hit the pads, I weren't really no good, but I just liked it. And then the next week, Wednesday, it's like, it's like the same boxing coach came back. So I went back again that week, and, I, and then literally every Wednesday from then, I kept on going back every single Wednesday. And then they couldn't afford him no more. And then I went up to the, uh, it was a boxing gym up in Canada Town that he mm -hmm. worked at. Um, and so I went up that gym, and then ever since then, I've been boxing ever since then. Um, I wasn't talented, but I was consistent because I loved it. Yeah. And then that consistency is what brought me, you know, all the way here. I'm still doing it. Yeah. 2019, must have been about 10 years now. Yeah. Yeah, just kind of like 10 How old are you now? I'm 27 now. 27, and you've had 20 fights? Uh, 20 pro fights. Yeah, 20. And uh, how no, many? I think, have, I think 21 pro fights. Tw 21, okay. Yeah. And how many um, amateur fights um, do you have? Only had 18. Only 18, yeah. yeah. And which, which club did you say it was? Uh, I was at the Repton. Okay, yeah. cool. So um, you got into boxing, you mm -hmm. were consistent. I, I wanted to like label on that word mm -hmm. because I feel that no matter whether you're in boxing, mm -hmm. whether you want to be the best father, mm -hmm. whether you want to be the best, I don't know, mm -hmm chef mm -hmm. or business person or investor i think it does come down to and i was speaking to your brother about yeah. this will mm -hmm. the focus mm -hmm. and the consistency mm -hmm. how important do you think that is in life in general i think that's so important but with me it took boxing to put that mindset into me and i feel like if i didn't get into boxing i wouldn't really know the importance of being consistent and and to be you know of being consistent through the good times and the bad times and being and and to be dedicated on your craft I remember certain days, that, you know, the first time I, that I got into boxing, um, I used to smoke a lot of weed, and then, you know, I quit smoking for maybe two weeks, and then I had a few puffs again, and then I went, and then I went up to the gym, I sparred this guy that I battered last week, and I got battered, I was literally so tired after round two, and I was like, listen, I can't smoke no more, I've got to choose either boxing or the smoking, and then I quit smoking, and then I got fitter and fitter and fitter, and I feel like it put that mass into me as, you know, I have to find a goal and then I have to sacrifice everything. I have to put everything down. It don't matter if I have to get there on a bus. It don't matter if it's cold, 
raining it don't matter i have to find a way and you know that in, and that's put that mindset into me so now i feel like in life i can quit boxing now i can go into any other field um, and i can become better than the you know you know and like, than other guys that are there now because i've got that mindset more in me even though these guys might have two years three years past me i feel like I've got that hard work ethic and mm-hmm. I can work harder than all these guys. So I, don't, I feel like in life, I could do anything in life and yeah. I'll be good at it and I'll be successful. Because that boxing, it's, it's not like I was, I, you know, it's not like I was the best on the first day I was there and I was so talented. I wasn't, I wasn't even good. But it's that consistency and I feel like it don't matter what field that I'm in, that consistency can take anyone anywhere. Yeah, 100%. Um, I feel like a lot of people, um, not everybody, mm. but there's some people that overlook the power of hard work. I feel mm. like you need to work on the right thing really mm. hard. Because yeah. if you work really hard on the wrong thing, you're mm. only going to emphasize the wrong thing mm. more and more and more, and it's going to compound. Mm. Going back to boxing specifically, and then we'll talk more about like mindset and obviously mm. how it's transferable, your skill set and mindset. Yeah. So uh, 21 fights in, mm. still a young man, mm. still got a lot, lot, lot to achieve. Mm. What do you want to achieve at the sport? First of all, what I want to achieve out of the sport, I want to secure my future. I think that's the main thing. First and, you know, I want to, you know, as I was young, as an amateur, I had a different mindset. I was, it was more, I want to become a world champion. I want to win this, I want to win that. And then I turn pro and I I look at people that have actually got those belts and they're bankrupt today. And I'm just like, the most important thing in boxing is to secure your future. A belt can't, a belt can't take me, you know, like to get a nice car, a nice house. A belt isn't going to, a belt isn't going to, isn't gonna finance my lifestyle. Mm-hmm. It's the finances that does. And I feel like I wanna become successful, but I also wanna earn and I wanna invest. And you know, that's what I want out of this game. I wanna secure my future, that's the main thing. Anything else that comes <coughs> after that <coughs> is a bonus. And I welcome every bonus. I wanna win as many belts as I, as I want. But first and foremost, my mindset is about securing myself. Yeah, wicked, okay, cool. Um, and have you got a plan like two years, five years, ten years from now you want to retire? You haven't really worked, worked that bit out? I haven't really worked it out, but I feel like every day when I wake up I feel different. You know, some days I retired once. I retired, you know, a few months ago and then the next day I, I woke up and I was like, you know what, I'm back. So I feel like you never know what's going to happen in life. I could be injured next week. Mm. I could be, you know, I could get injured. I could, you know, I'm, I don't know. I feel like in life, I feel like you, you can't plan too far, you know, because anything can happen life yeah. is like a rocky boat and it's like our boxing careers it's more like a rocky boat you think you know what, i'm gonna win, i'm gonna win this fight and then go for this and then go for that and then you might lose that fight and then your whole plan's gone yeah so i feel like it's about taking one fight at each you know you know i take each day as it comes and i don't plan too far ahead okay cool um i interviewed uh, a good friend of mine now mm. a guy called kieran richardson mm. played for england scored mm. his debut actually mm. man united and when I was asking him the transition between football mm. and then going into business, because mm. at the end of the day, if you're the best boxer, mm. if you're the best footballer or anything, at some point that will mm. come to an end because mm. father time catches up with yeah, you. Yeah. So like you said, you need to plan for your future. Mm. I said to him, how did how'd you go about doing that? And fortunately enough, he had a mentor, which was his dad. Mm. And his dad said, even when he got a contract for five years mm. at the age of 21 or 22, he said, treat this first season as your very last. Mm. He went, what do you mean? So I've just signed a five-year contract mm. with one of the best clubs in the world. Mm. And now, treat it like it's your last, mm. because if you keep on treating it like it's your last, you'll use the money wisely. Mm. Mm. So the question I want to ask you, how important do you think it is to like have like mentors or right people around you? I think having mentors are quite important. Like with me, my father wasn't there. I don't really know him. I haven't seen him in years, but it's just me and my brothers. And we're so young, but I feel like my mentors have more been the adults that I've met. You know, my old coach, Tony Sims, yeah. even though we parted on bad terms, every day in the gym, the advice that he would give me, he would say, listen, invest into property, invest into business, buy this, buy that. If you've got that money, put that aside all the time. And this guy wasn't a mentor, he was just a coach. But as my coach, he also he, like, he also went and he took on that role as a mentor. And I would listen to him in the gym, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I'll go home and I'll, you know, and I'll kind of forget what he said. But then he, but then it like, you know, it's like after, is that after saying it, you know, for months and months and months, a few months went by and I was like, maybe I should, maybe I should. And I'm thankful that I've learned that from him. Mm-hmm. Um, so now I'm more thinking about 
investing and thinking about my finances and you know so i feel like as a mentor he's been there i've had a few other mentors that are also in different fields of life and as i'm sitting down and i'm talking to them they don't really advise me but they tell me about their experiences and yeah. by telling me about their life i'm still taking some of that upon myself and of you know so it's not really mentoring but it's more taking advice by you know just by watching how other people live yeah and by seeing the mistakes that they've made and the choices that, that you know like that they've made and um, and then um, based on all that, I can come up with the best thing for me. Yeah, yeah, it's important. Um, I got a friend of mine. I, I mention mm. him all the time on my podcast. He's mm. not famous, but very very successful. He's one mm. of the most successful mm. people I know. Mm. I think uh, I think his company's worth probably half a billion. Mm. Uh, he's got the largest private care homes in the country. Mm. Good, like I said, good friend of mine called Ozzy. And he said mm. to me once, he said, "You can look rich or you can become wealthy." Mm -hmm. And when he said to me, he said to me that that little mm -hmm. soundbite, mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? Like, mm -hmm. there are a lot of people that look rich mm -hmm. because of their Instagram or their Facebook or the way they they mm -hmm. kind of hold themselves. But really, behind the scenes, they, they haven't got they haven't that, got yeah. much. And when that triggered in my mm -hmm. mind a mm -hmm. few years ago, I mm -hmm. thought, you know what? I'm now going to get on this investing yeah. and and building assets. Yeah. Um, and I feel I feel that it's only when you hear it straight from the horse's mm -hmm. mouth, someone yeah. who is validated in that sector. Yeah it really, really strikes a chord with That's you. what I've said to myself over the past few months or so. I'm going to come off all that social media stuff. Like I don't really upload on my social media no more because I've now realised that it's just fake. Everyone tries to live a certain lifestyle that they haven't got. And instead of me going out and buying a, you know, and buying a car or, you know, you know, or to go out and to get like a nice watch that costs 10 to 15k because I was going to do that. Mm -hmm. I thought, no, invest it into property. I will get that watch and then I have it and it's just there. I will get a car and it, de and, that, and it devalues as, as soon as I drive out of that place. But if I get a property, I, ha I have got that there and I've got that investment there and it's only going to rise and rise and rise. So even though, I'm, even though I might not have a watch, if I had a watch, I would actually be more poor than I am now. Yeah. So I'm like, just be smart, invest. And then, you know, let's say if I make a few mil, then I can think about, you know, what I want to have fun. But at this minute right now, I'm not, I'm, I don't feel like I'm in a place to have fun. Yeah. That's why I don't really go on all that social media, TV, because I feel like it kind of tempts me to live a lifestyle that I can't really maintain right now. Mm -hmm. And that's what so many pro athletes fall into. And that's a mistake that's, you know, that I've seen a few pro athletes make. Yeah. And I'm not going to, and I, I said to myself, I'm not going to be making that same mistake. Yeah. I think, uh, like, talking specifically on boxing, mm -hmm. I think a lot of boxers, certainly I do, I, when I'm when I'm when I'm looking at them on social media, you probably look at the very very top ones and mm. think that's how all boxers should live. Mm. I, I'll throw a name out: Floyd Mayweather mm. made over a billion dollars in his whole career. Mm -hmm. um, he could come back at the age of sixty and probably still make a hundred million because mm. of his name. Mm. Two private jets, doing this, doing mm. that, and that is great and that's phenomenal mm. for him. But the reality is, as you're coming up the ranks, mm. that's not how you should be living. Mm. It's like a good business, right? Mm -hmm. A good business should start lean. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't get a fancy office. You shouldn't mm -hmm. get a fancy car. You shouldn't get a fancy this and that. You should keep lean mm -hmm. until you get to a level yeah. five or ten years in where the money's just mm -hmm. coming in and now you yeah. can kind of treat yourself a yeah. bit. I think a smart man lives on his in a smart man lives on the investments that he makes. Yeah. Like you don't get paid 100K, think, you know what, I'm gonna spend 100K on this. No, you get 100K, you and then you invest it in that 100K, it might bring you a thousand pound a month. Yeah. And then you live on that money, a thousand pound a month. That's your wage. But that's why, you know, all these all these athletes out here and, and they've got the wrong mindset because the world is a, it's like the world's there and they're expecting a certain lifestyle from them. Now, I was in a bagel shop a few weeks ago and the lady there, you know, the lady that works there, oh, good looking girl, she, so she came up to me and she was like, listen, because of the because of like you know and like the name that I've got and the person that I am, I would expect you to be here in a you know in a few Balenciaga shoes, you know, five hundred pound shoes, you know, you know a jumper I had on it was a it was a it was a it was like Adidas top. It wasn't anything flash. Like I would you know, I would expect you in a coat like this and she like in you know in shoes like this. And I was like, nah, I'm investing into property. I just I just got a place just now. Like like you know what I'm gonna I, you know what I'm fine. I'm sweet. I would, I would rather, I would rather be rich, than look rich, mm. and you know I feel like this world. And then as I left that place, I thought, you know what, I might, you know what, I might go out and shop and buy a few expensive stuff because I can't afford it. I might go out and buy a few expensive shoes, a few expensive tops just to wear. But then I thought, nah, I'm not trying to impress these guys because I, because I can literally, I can do that, and then I will go broke, and they're not going to be helping me up. Yeah. All these people, they will see me poor broke, and they will laugh at me. So. 
screw all these guys, I'm gonna do what's best. Yeah. You know, what's best and like what's best for me. Yeah. There's a there's a book if you haven't heard about it or anyone listening or watching, this is my recommendation, my advice. Mm. It's uh, written by a guy called Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah. And the title is called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. There's number one, there's mm. number two, and there's shoot off books called Retire Rich, Retire Young, and all that mm. kind of stuff. Property Guy. Mm. The book itself has sold over 40 million copies, so mm. that tells you about it. Mm. And it talks about the fundamentals of buying assets or liabilities. So, mm. a very simple one a liability is a car. Mm. If it's costing you money, that's a liability. An asset is something that pumps money into your pocket. Mm. So, if you put it into an asset, which every single month is dripping you, even if it's a little bit of money, 500 quid or a grand into your pocket every single mm. month and it compounds over time, that is an asset. And unfortunately, I don't think schools do mm. enough of that. Mm -hmm. um, talking about school then, I mean, what was you like at school? I was a bad kid. I've been kicked out of every, of every school that I've, you know, that I've ever been to. I got kicked out of my primary school, my first secondary school, and my second one. I wasn't dumb, I wasn't thick. I could do maths, English, science on a basic level. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't the best at maths, English or science, but I understood them at a basic level, but I knew that school wasn't really my thing. I couldn't sit there in the English class and I wasn't interested in, you know, Macbeth or, you know, So funny, I, I learned that as well. I learned that, <laughs> yeah, in uh, English literature. I wasn't really interested in, you know, in things like, you know, Shakespeare and, you know, this and, I wasn't really interested in that. So I thought, so with school, it wasn't really my thing, but what they don't teach you in school is about business, is about how to invest. Yeah. I'm like, I'm getting taught about Macbeth, but I'm not getting taught about tax. No. So then like the first times I had to pay tax was maybe four, five years ago, four years ago, I had to pay tax. I'm making tax. Now, what's tax? And then Tim's, you know, like he was there and he told me, listen, if you're earning over a certain amount, then you don't have to pay tax. And I'm thinking like, no, there must be, you know, some way around this that I don't have to pay tax. <coughs> He's like, no, listen, pay tax. But it's like now, it's like I now understand that, but I'm like, I'm paying tax but it's going where? Like, what's it going to? And he was like, listen, it goes to, like, you know, like the fire brigade and the ambulance and all that. Because I didn't know where that money comes from and to, into, like, the NHS that I've been using for, you know, uh, you know, in, like, for, mm. you know, in, like, for years. And I'm not sure. I wasn't sure where that money comes from. Yeah. But now, I have now have that understanding. But I didn't get taught about that in my school. I got taught about Macbeth and how to, you know, nine squared equals 81 and, you know, <laughs> the square root of, you know, 100 is, you know, this. I should have learned about tax. I should have learned how to open up a business, how to start a business, how to invest, bank accounts, credit cards, you know, a debit card, like a credit card, like, I didn't know what that was. Yeah. And I feel like these are important things that we're not taught in school. And I feel like it's like we've been kind of programmed to fail. Like, I'm learning about tax at the age of 25. I'm going to try and avoid it somehow and get caught and then end up going to jail and end up going broke. But if I learned about this a few years ago, I'd be like, yep, you know what, I'm ready to pay tax. I've been ready three or four years earlier. Yeah. But I've learned about it so late to the point where I'm trying to think of every way. But I'm like, nah, pay your tax. So I pay it now, but you know, it would have been a lot better if I learned it earlier in life. Yeah. I feel like they need to, they need to, look, school serves a purpose mm -hmm. and I can't knock it completely, but I feel like it's dated. I feel like yeah. no one's come along and yeah. said, right, we need to upgrade this system. Because mm -hmm. like you said, even the mm -hmm. basic life skills that mm -hmm. like, even like if you move into a flat for the mm -hmm. first time, mm -hmm. No one tells you about water bills, really. Yeah, yeah, no yeah, one yeah. tells you about council yeah. tax. No one tells you about this and that. And mm. you're almost left in, 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 in the lurch mm. a bit. Mm. Um, so, yes, school for me as well was, I, it just never, it never really triggered in my mind. I never got mm. excited by it. But mm. when I found sales, mm. um, which I'm going to explain why I feel that sales and boxing are very, very similar, mm. um, it allowed me to have my own personality. Mm. I could use my energy, enthusiasm, excitement to deliver yeah. over, the, over a telephone or in front of a client and make some money. And it was yeah. uncapped and I loved it. Yeah. And when I got into boxing, I found it was very similar because in sales or boxing, you could look good on the pads, you could look good off a sales call, but the moment you get in that ring on that sales call, if you mm. haven't put the hard graft in, you it get shows, found out. Yeah, 100%. Um, and it's all about the people that you're around, the nutrition, the uh, you know, the training that you're doing, it's the full package. Mm -hmm. um, so with your training then, um, as, as a pro boxer, they talk about levels, right? They talk about mm -hmm. from amateurs, to maybe white collar, the Queensbury League, mm -hmm. uh, pros. What, what's like the difference between your training regime to like a regular fitness person? Uh, mine involves a lot more boxing, obviously, a lot mm -hmm. more skill, whereas like, you know, like the local fitness person, they work on their fitness, you know, but with me, I work on my, Boxing, how can I say it? 
everyone's got a goal. It, like if you're training, a person might be training to run a marathon. I've got to train, so I, you know, so they might run ten miles a day. But for boxing, I've got to do. I, I feel like I have to work each of them fields. I have to do like my long runs and my sprints, explosive work, my circuits. I've got to work every muscle in the body. And I feel like a few other sports, like they only work their legs. You know, a prime example. If you look at football, it's literally just legs. Like they got to do a few skills, and you know, and then they're fine. But in boxing, we have to work our footwork. We have to work our, you know, our arms, our hands, your neck, our sharpness, our neck, yeah. our feet, every bone, every muscle. In this, you know, it's like in boxing, it's like we have to work a lot more. So I feel like boxing entails everything, all in one, and that's what makes, you know, it's what makes. I feel like it's what makes boxing so much harder mm. than you know than other you know games. Yeah, definitely. Um, you said something earlier which I definitely uh, second, which is um, speaking about amateurs to mm. to the pros mm. and amateurs. I was an mm. amateur myself from mm. Bromley and Downham, and I know you was. Yeah. Um, they're like fencing, yeah. they're like they're like annoying flies sometimes, mm -hmm. and it's a good thing to, to learn. Yeah. But when you get into pros, it's more about like your IQ. Yeah. You're calculated. Yeah. But in amateurs, you're only fighting about three rounds. But in a pro, it can be ten rounds, twelve rounds, and you know, and it's all three minute rounds. Yeah. With no head guards and the gloves are more thin. So I feel like to train to like like to fight, you know, you know, in like a twelve round fight, you have got to do more long runs because you have to be more fit. Whereas as an amateur, you like you like to do a few sprints and then that's it because to fight three two minute rounds it's you know I find it quite easy it's a sprint it's like you go in there you throw a few shots and the fight's done but in this game in like the pro game round three then round four five <laughs> six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve then you know it's like the lights and the pressure from all the fans and the crowd there's a lot more hard work that goes into you know that goes you know that goes into this game and you've got to be sharp and you've got to be switched on more whereas as an amateur it's like to be switched on for like, uh, like for, you know, it's like for three rounds. It's literally easy. Yeah. But as a pro, like you, like you might kind of switch off around round five, round six, and then you have to learn. Like, you have, like you must learn. It's like, it's like, it's more how to be switched on from round three until round twelve. Yeah. It's a lot more harder. It takes a lot more effort, and you've got to train for that. Whereas, like, to do it for only two to three rounds, yeah, it's more naturally in you anyway. Yeah, yeah. So it's a lot more easier. Yeah. You've had about 14 KOs. Uh, have I? I think, I believe, yeah, yeah when I was Must researching, be. yeah. yeah. Um, so that obviously means you can bang. Mm -hmm. um, is that something you're born with or something that you nurture over time? I think power is something that you're born with. It can be worked on, it can improve. It, and how would you I'd work on that, though? You work on it by doing different exercises, like your circuit work. It's like, for example, like, it's, like, it's like I have a thing in our camp, so it's like we have a band. Yep. and you put the band on a bag or you might put it on a chair like this and you just punch, punch and that, and that, and that punching resistance and that push like that things, you know, things, you know, just things like that it, it makes your punches a lot more harder like you get weights, if you little dumbbells you just punch with them so we do things like that and that, you know, things like that you know, that all increases like our punching power you get a ball, you see like a, you know, like a 5 kg ball and you throw it onto the wall and then you get it from back at you and you throw it back onto the wall. Hmm. All things like that increase, you know, like your punching power. I feel like everyone's born with a natural punching, you know, with like a natural punching strength and you can increase it by maybe 10 to 15%. But you can't make a weak person, like you can't turn them into Hulk. Yeah. It can only be, it can only be increased by 10 to 15%. And they say the same thing about speed, you know. Yeah. Some guys are just born <coughs> fast. <coughs> and they can't. I mean, can't always been fast. Yeah, as an right amateur. Like, he, like he's more been fast. Whereas other people like Floyd, he might not be fast, but Floyd's more sharp and the timing's more there. Timing Floyd knows is, that, you know what, yeah. I might not be as fast as him, but my sharpness and my timing is gonna counteract speed. So yeah, everyone's born, you know, with, you know, it's like natural speed, strength, but it can only be increased by 10 to 15%. Yeah, and for the people that are like fanatics about boxing, cause mm. I am, and I've had the pleasure of be being in doing a bit of sparring and pros, people mm. like Bradley Skeet, Johnny mm. Garton, Ricky Boyden, Sam Webb, mm. a couple of people. What is it, like, I've, I've been hit by them, but with, you know, head guard on, mm. and 14 ounce gloves, 16 ounce gloves or yeah. whatever. What is it like in mm. a big fight mm -hmm. where you've got all these people around you and then suddenly, bang, you get hit. What, you. what is that like? I've got two losses, but I've only, I've got robbed in one of them, so I've more got one loss. No, I took some damage. Um, when you when you feel it though, I mean mm. your mind or the emotions. What what's it like? It doesn't hurt, 
people feel like you know it, you know it like to get hit people think it hurts boxing doesn't hurt a punch doesn't hurt you it more shakes our brain it's a brain that shakes a glove is like it's like it's not physical pain it's just that like the brain shakes and you're more days out um it just feels like you get days out and you've got to try you know and you know you, like you have to try and get back to your normal mind and you know in 10 seconds if you get a count or if you don't get a count, you have to move around the ring and try to, you know, and just wait until your mind gets back. But it, it's more like a brain shake. It's more like you spin around for like half a minute yeah. and then that world going around you, world going, you, you know, it's like the room goes round and round and round. That's, you know, it's the same way, you know, it, you know it's like how it feels if you get hit. It's, just, it's like literally like the same way. So what I used to do as an amateur, I got to, like, like my coach as an amateur, he used to make us, like, it's like he'll get us all in a box ring and then make a spin around, and you spin around for like a minute, and then you, and like you, you know, and then like, I, I like you put your hands up, and you got to hit the pads. And you got to hit the <laughs> I'm pads. Visualizing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and things, you know, just things like that. It gets you used to this game as a pro. So like you get hit, and then you have to try and you know and see where things are. Try and put your hands up and try and get back to normal. Yeah. Um, as fast as you, you know, as fast as you can. Yeah. Cool. Um, I know you're. When I'm watching you like um, build up for a fight, mm -hmm. what I love about your kind of persona to mm -hmm. in front of like the fans and stuff mm -hmm. is your, your vocal. Mm -hmm. And I think that you need all kinds of different characters in this mm -hmm. sport. Mm -hmm. and, and in UFC, mm -hmm. Conor McGregor is a great example. Mm -hmm. Mayweather is a great example. Tyson Fury is a great example. Mm -hmm. So many of these people, because mm -hmm. whether you like these people or not, they're interesting for the sport. And they make our game exciting. Yeah, and I was going to say, how important is it for you to like promote yourself? You know, you yeah. are a, a, a Hara Davis, yeah, mm. you might be a great fighter, mm. but unless you promote yourself right, you won't get that core following. I feel like in Bogdan, a promoter doesn't really do their job that right. It's like, well, it depends on what, you know, it depends on what their job is, you know. But I think a promoter's job is to go out there and to promote, you know, like the guys that they've got. But if you look at Matt they've got over 40 fighters. He can't push out everyone. Eddie Hearn, he can't like he can't push out me, AJ, Dillian White, Conor Ben. You know, you know all of us at the same time. So it's more our job as you know as fighters, like to put ourselves out there. And I couldn't wait for this guy Eddie Hearn to you know he likes to go online and send tweets. I go online and, he, and he's been talking about AJ. AJ this day, AJ that day, AJ the next day again. It's all about AJ. I was like, well, you know what? I got to find a way to put myself out there. I can't be waiting for this guy because, you know, I feel like if I wait for him, it won't, you know, it's mm. like it, it's like it won't happen. Yeah. So I have to go out there and I have to push out myself. So I will go online and I'll be calling everyone bums. You bum, <laughs> you bum, you bum, you bum. And then they hate me, yeah. but they're still bringing attention to me. Yeah. And I feel like, I feel like that's business. I feel like that's business. It's like, you have to have, a, you know, like you have to have that, you know, that mindset. But other fighters think, oh, you know what? If I talk and I lose, then I look bad. Just don't think about that. Yeah. Think about, you know what, as a fighter, I have a job. I've got to fight, I've got to promote myself. Eddie Holmes, Frank Warren, I'm not going to be out there talking about you, you know, you know, you know, like, you know, each day. It's up to you as a fighter, like, to go out there and to promote yourself any way you can. So I've got a page on my YouTube now, I'm on YouTube, I'm on Instagram, I'm quite active on there, I'm on Twitter. I'm not active now, but, you know, but, if, you know, but, like, but let's say if I'm going to fight, I promote myself for eight weeks. Mm -hmm. I'm on there every day, every day, literally each day. I'm more online, banging things up online. Yeah. And that's what and, and that's what's helped me to get yeah. to where I am now. Even though I am good, so you know, I feel like ultimately it's about how good that a fighter is. But then, secondly, it's about how he puts himself out there. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's also quite in, yeah. That's quite important. Definitely, definitely. I think there's a good lesson, and it's like the 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 mad paradox between. Mm -hmm your craft, your career, mm. your business, your vision, mm. is you kind of now need to use Instagram, Facebook, mm. they've got billions of subscribers, mm. so it's free marketing mm. for you. But then at the same time, if you use it the wrong way, mm. you get pulled into it mm. and you lose hours of your day. And mm. then before you know it, you're not productive. So it's about having a happy medium, which is promoting yourself, but then being focused and dedicated and mm. saying, you know what, I'm being disciplined now, putting that to one side and I'm mm. gonna focus on what I do best, which is boxing in your mm. case. Um, I was gonna actually touch on something you just reminded me. So uh, talking about like uh, twi Twitter battles and stuff. Mm. Why the Why the hell did someone in a different craft reach mm. out to, uh, and kind of bad mouth you, Darren Till? Darren Till. What What was all that about? Basically, he's from a city. Yeah, he's from Liverpool. 
and from Liverpool, I've knocked out two of his friends. Him okay. and you know, I have I think I knocked out Derry Matthews first. Yeah, that was a good fight. Yeah, really I, good fight. Yeah, I knocked him out first, and then I knocked out Tom Farrell. Um, and I went up there, you know, in the press conference, I was quite disrespectful. I was quite rude. And obviously, him being in a different field, he still didn't like the fact that I was rude to them. And he was, you know, and he'll be online every day saying this about me and saying that about me. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna wait. As soon as, as soon as this guy gets beat, I'm gonna laugh at him. And that's what I done. The guy got knocked out cold. The guy got the guy got knocked down like a ton of bricks. I was sat at home laughing to myself. I went online, I tweeted about him. Next thing, everyone has up for you're so rude. I'm so disrespectful. But I'm thinking, I didn't start this beef. It was him. I mm. didn't start this. I just I didn't start this. I just finished it. And you know they can't take the fact that I'm good at finishing things. Like it's like it's like it's like they want to see me as a victim. But as soon as I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna fight it back. Like boxing fans don't really like it and say that I'm too arrogant. But I wasn't too arrogant at the time that I was getting, you know, that I've been getting dissed by him, you know, each day. I wasn't, you know, like I wasn't disrespectful then, and they didn't say anything about him. But as soon as it's my turn to now, you know, I, I like to now fight it back. Yeah, I'm the villain. <laughs> but you know, it's the role that I've embraced. Yeah. Well, again, I mean, it just it, even for the fact that me mm. bringing it up, it's mm. just interesting. Mm. I just love hearing about it because mm. he's not a boxer. He's mm. obviously in the UFC. Even things like that, it more causes hype. And I'm more about, you know, I'll be quiet for a few weeks and then I do one thing, bang. Everyone talk about me and then <laughs> I lay low again. And then, and then in a few weeks, I'll do something mad. Everyone talks about me or how Davis does this or how Davis says this or says that. It's, it's all about marketing. And even though I'm not fighting, I still make sure that I keep myself in a public eye. I keep myself being talked about, relevant, just so I don't fade yeah. out. Yeah, I have kind of faded out, but I'm not. I haven't totally faded out. That's always why every few weeks I, I have to do certain mad. I have to find something. I have to speak about something. And you know, and boxing fans are like, boxing fans are like the wind. Like this, it's like they're like puppets. Boxing fans are like kids. Boxing fans are quite thick. Fans in general are quite thick. They it's like they don't know that like, boxing is all an act. This whole arrogant persona that I put on is an act is a, like it's literally all like like it's like I went up north I, I called them seven pounds in our cunts I said this I said that <laughs> like it's an act and I say yeah. things like this because I know that it's going to make them it, I know I, I know that it's going to make them talk and make them cry it's, it's, it's like a kid it's like you put a sweet there and then they cry for it you cry for it and then you <laughs> give it and, and then you give it to them boxing fans are thick just being honest boxing fans are like baby adults they're like baby adults like they're kids in their minds like it's so easy just to manipulate them and to make them do and say what I want. I feel like if you hate me, don't talk about me because obviously if you hate me and you're talking about me, it's only going to make me rise and make me more famous. And they know that, but then yet they will still go out there and talk about me and talk about me and talk, you know, and say things about me. And I just sit there and think, are oh, these guys thick? But when it comes down to it, these guys really are thick. Like if there's someone that I don't like. And you're and you're saying something. I'm not gonna respond to you. Mm. I'm not gonna respond to you. It's like it's like it's like I fought Taylor. Yeah. Like before the fight, I gave it to him. I gave it to him. As soon as I lost, this guy sent up a few tweets about me. I didn't respond not once. I didn't respond not once because I know as soon as I respond, I'm making it more known and I'm making the fact that I lost a lot more. I'm more putting it out in their faces. Yes, I got beat by this guy. I said, I said to myself, you know what, if he talks about, about me, I'm not going to respond. If, you don't, if I don't respond, soon it will go in these people's mind and, and they won't think about the fact that I got beat by him. Yeah. And he sent up a few tweets about me and I'm stopped. But mm. I feel like, I feel like if I carried on, then it will be more, you know, then the fans will say, oh, you got beat, you got beat. So I'm quite smart, but boxing fans are quite, you know, these guys are like, are like, they're like kids, they're like kids. I, look, I, I, I totally hear what you're saying. I remember mm. when I, um, I saw the uh, uh, interaction that you had with Mayweather mm. that time. Mm. And when I saw that, I was like, whoa, what's going on here? Yeah. And I was really, yeah, inqu- yeah. I was like, wow, yeah. this is, what happened there? But I got like a million views um, on YouTube. I got like a million yeah. and a half views on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, first done an opening um, at the O2 and I was there, you know. I'm a fan. Listen, I'm a fan of Floyd. Like, I'm a fan. I wanted a picture. I've got my picture. And everyone, came, and then they came up to Flay and were like, listen, this guy's the champ. Flay was like, how much you weigh? I'm like, I'm 140. I'm like, cool, I've got a tank. I think tank, I think that, I think, I think that he can have you. I'm like, listen, this is Flay. Don't dare say anything to this guy. But then I'm thinking, listen, I'm here, I'm with Flay. Then everyone's been out there and taking pictures. I have to stand out. I'm like, how can I stand out? I said, listen, man, I have to confront him. That's the only way, yeah. that, that's the only way that 
I'm gonna stand out from all these other a few hundred people here. I have to stand out. I can't be like these guys here. So that's why I went backstage and I was like, listen, Flo, that thing that you said, to, you know, that thing that you said to me a few hours back, I find it quite, I find it a bit disrespectful. So if you want, I can take him on. And then we had a few back and forth. I made sure that it got filmed. I told my friend, listen, make sure, you know, I like to make sure, you know, that I, I like that he's there and the camera's there and the camera's on and it's all filmed, it's all documented. Because then, if it's filmed and it gets, uh, and like, you know, and like, they, and, and like, you know, if it gets filmed and it goes online, I'll be mega, but I'll be, you know, I'll be, you know, it's like I'll be big for the next week or so. And then I got put onto Worldside Hip Hop, which is like a massive site. Yeah. Everyone spoke about it, you know, I've been talked about by this person and by that person, and it worked. But I didn't really hate Flay, I didn't, like, I didn't even mind what he said. I just, I just, I just, I just knew, I have to, I just knew it's like I have to stand out. I can't be like these guys. Here yeah, yeah. Because I'm in the business that I have to sell myself. <clears throat> but as soon as my, as my boxing career is over, I'm gonna delete all my social media, delete Instagram, Twitter, and I want to become a normal person one day. I don't want to be in this, you know. I don't want to have to be, you know, talked about and spoken about. I'm only yeah. doing it because it's my job and it's yeah, how yeah. I earn. But as soon as I'm out of this game, listen, I'm gonna change my name probably. I move out the country. I move up. I move up to Coventry somewhere. These guys are not going to hear about me. I'm missing this game just to make money. And then once I'm done, I'm done. You can talk about the next guy that wants to be arrogant like I am. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, I, I remember hearing Floyd saying, whether you like me or whether you don't, I'm mm. still getting paid either way. And yeah. that's the importance of mm. putting yourself out there commercially. Mm. And um, something I was telling your brother as well. I, my mentor for my podcast mm. is a guy called Rob Moore. Multi-millionaire from property. Mm. He's got the biggest... Um, podcast for the entrepreneurial and business sector. Mm. It's called The Disruptive Entrepreneur. Got about 2.2 million subscribers. Mm. And I had the pleasure of going on there with Kieran Richardson and being mm. interviewed. And basically what they did, and there's a point to this, I leveraged all of his followers and I got mm. a load on, onto mm. mine. So mm. what you've done with the, the Floyd scenario, mm. it's fucking smart yeah. because you're leveraging someone who's yeah, got yeah. millions and millions of followers yeah. and Obviously, you, you, you fought fire with fire. Mm. He's very outspoken. Mm. You was very outspoken, mm. and therefore you become hot. And I think yeah. going back to what we were saying earlier, mm -hmm. you could be a really good boxer or a good business person, but if you don't know how to promote yourself mm. and take the opportunities, because mm. no one else is going to do it for you, exactly, yeah. you're going to fall short and you're not going to hit your, your potential. Exactly, 100%. So that's why I've always had that mindset. You know, Ever since that I turned pro, I said to myself, I have to be different. I have to sell. Because I can't sell any tickets. I can't go out there and sell up. 100 tickets like these other guys do I can't sell tickets I can't physically sell them I haven't got enough guys that have got money like that I don't know enough guys that are you know you know you know and like you know you know guys that say you know what I'm gonna buy 10 tickets 20 tickets a few other guys do because because they're from areas that are rich and they've got money I'm from Hackney people ain't got no money around there so I, I said to myself like you know what I have to sell I have to find a way to sell just be arrogant and make people hate you and they'll come out to come and see you get beat. Yeah. And that's it. That's, a, that's, a, that's exactly right. And it's Every, still working. Yeah. It's still, it's still working today. Yeah, it's so, it is so important. Um, mm. It's another thing about the school system. I was never, I never even knew what sales was. Mm. I thought it was just some sort of common like, mm. if you couldn't get a job any, anywhere else, you'd go mm. into sales. Mm. But actually, if you look at the core of any business, anything, even if you're a, a single mum or you, you're mm. a father, at the core of that person or that enterprise is sales. Mm. Because mm. if you can't communicate with your kid, Mm. or if you can't communicate with staff members or colleagues then you've got nothing sales is so important mm -hmm. um, so the school system we were talking as well about bringing boxing back into mm -hmm. schools because I, I live in, uh, on the outskirts of mm -hmm. London now but I'm from Tulsa originally um, and I know that all around London there's this big problem with knife crime mm -hmm. gangs do you think if boxing was reintroduced that some of that knife crime will be suppressed? Yeah, but I feel like in boxing, even if they don't box, boxing shows you that there's other things out there. I feel like kids nowadays in school, they think that the only thing that there is in life is math, English and science, and they don't know that there's other avenues. But in school, like, they're not bringing all of these other opportunities there into school. Like, these kids, it should be boxing in school, football, it should be hockey, tennis, and then, and then we'll give all these kids a chance to know, well, you know what, I'm not into math, English and science, but I like this. And it will give them, a, it's like opportunity to find their niche in life or to find what they want. Mm. It's, like, it's like with me, so, like, so, it's like, so let's say if there has, if there has like a boxing guy in the school, I would have known that I loved this game from when I was 10 years old, but it took me to when I was like 17, 18 years old. 
until I found it out. And I found it out, it, it was in a youth club. And I didn't know what I really wanted in life. I wasn't really into anything in life. I thought, well, you know what? I need to make money, but I don't want to work in answer. I'm not a scientist. I don't want to sit there talking about atoms. I don't, I'm not interested in stuff. Mm. Until I box, I put on a glove and I punch, and like, you know, like the pads. And like, you know what? I love this. And I feel like we need other things in schools. We need other, I feel like we should have art where they've got art in school. Like, but there should be everything there. Even they, if it's just once, it would give, a, it would give kids a chance uh, to know, you know what, there's more than this. There's more than mashing and science. Yeah. Well, even when you mention art, yeah, you're right, they do have art, but mm. it's like a, maybe a small small yeah, thing. They should, put, yeah, yeah, they should pump yeah. more money yeah. or bring more awareness about being mm. creative. Mm. Mm. Um, and with boxing, what I love about boxing is, one, it gets you fit anyway, mm. so everyone should be fit. Mm. Two, it gets you prepared for outside life. Mm. I don't promote anyone mm. going to violence, but let's mm. be right, someone probably in your lifetime will start on you. Yeah. And if you can hold yourself yeah. together and you can handle yourself, mm. then it, it helps you. It helps, yeah. The other thing as well is it's a social sport. So unlike yeah. maths and English, yeah. you don't have these networking events really where I always talk about atoms yeah. or let's talk about mm. algebra. Mm. What boxing does is, oh, uh, you're gonna spar this person, you could be mm. a promoter, you could be a nutritionist, you could be sports sports um, mm. therapist, you could be strength and conditioner. And then there's loads of little businesses which mm. trickle off of, exactly. yeah, of the yeah, sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it brings all these people together. One, yeah. And I think that's why boxing should be brought back into to so. the routine of school. I think you're right, 100%. And I, I do honestly think that, look, knife crime is always gonna probably be there, mm. but I think that boxing will bring it down because these people that feel that they need to get validated mm. by a gang or a peer group, mm. because they need to go and do something like that, if they had a straightener with someone in yeah. a ring at school, I think most of the beef or mm. the or the problems will be- You're Taken care of. Well, exactly, yeah, exactly. I, yeah, I agree. I think, that's so and I think that boxing's helped me out with, you know, ever since I was young, I've had, uh, it's like, I do star, as you can see, you know, but it's been there ever since I was young, my star came, I realised it when I was about maybe five years old. Like I couldn't speak right in school. And I'd be laughed at and I was quite nervous, you know, you know, like to talk and stuff, you know, it's like in my class I couldn't you know, I couldn't talk or, you know, I got you know, I got like a bit nervous. But now through boxing I'm talking on camera, I'm talking, you know, in crowds and stuff. And that confidence that is now giving me and like to know that you that you know, well, you know what? Just be confident and that confidence it can take you far in life. Because it's like now I'm because it's like now I'm not speaking is that in crowds and you know in like give you conferences and stuff and i feel like with boxing it gives you that like that confidence that is not giving me that i can talk and you know it's like in camera and crowds and that's a life skill that i've got now it's a life skill that i've got it's transferable yeah mate i can relate exactly what you're saying i mm. was in english i remember like it was yesterday mm. in secondary school mm. and the, the teacher mm. maybe out of i don't know whether she was slight bullying or what mm. she knew i couldn't really speak mm. properly back in the day mm. and she made me stand up in front of everyone and recite something yeah. and I melted mm. I couldn't get the mm. words out and everyone was laughing mm. cracking up yeah. and she continued to make me do it yeah. part of that I guess served me later on but I yeah. completely melted and from that point I, I said to myself at some point I'm going to mm. get good at this mm -hmm. and one of the reasons why I do the podcast is actually mm -hmm. to step up to my demons and think yeah, yeah, yeah. and just to prove myself every single week that mm. you know I can I can actually speak in front of people yeah and I think it's a transferable skill in anything you're going to go into. Mm. I think it's so important, and that's obviously what boxing's done. Mm. Um, so, if people want to follow you, O'Hara, where where can they find you? My social media. I'm on Twitter, Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm on everything. I'm on Snapchat. Uh, just, just my Instagram's at O'Hara Davis. The same as my Facebook and my Twitter and my Snapchat actually. Okay. Yeah, it's literally all the same. So yeah, I'm on. You know, Good. I'm guessing that they know anyway. If they're boxing fans, they probably know. Or they probably have me on there because I'm always being involved in some, yeah, you know, in some Instagram clout. So, um, your brother said to me that he was on his um, on his uh, podcast recently. Yeah. What's the podcast called uh, again? Box Hand TV. Okay, wicked. Yeah, so he's got a box. Uh, he's got a podcast which I've been on there. Cool. I've got my own page now. Uh, I'm on YouTube now as well, where cool. I like to talk about a few boxing issues. You know, I upload every Sunday. I, sp I speak about you know a few boxing issues. I speak about money, about the business side, about the side of boxing that the fans don't really see. Um, and I'm gonna shed light on the dark sides of this game. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, it's important to just mm. to reveal that. Any last kind of words? Any bit of advice or anything else that you want <sighs> to share with with the with the audience? I think we've spoken about everything. Pr pretty honest. much everything. Yeah. yeah. My catch phrase, I guess mm. you call it, or send off line is, mm. "Be happy, never content." Mm. So at the end of every episode, I say that. 
The reason why I say that is because being happy for me is a mm. state of mind. It's not when you've got more money. It's not mm. when you move to Australia. Mm. It's not when you do this or that. It's you're, you're happy. Mm. And yeah, you're going to go through fear, anxiety and stuff. And you can. it's okay to feel them. But mm. generally speaking, you're happy. But what never content means, the, the second part to it, is I'm happy, but I'm looking always for another level. Mm. I'm pushing on. So I'm happy, but on that journey to try and mm. find mm. like other levels to my life mm. and everything that I do. If I were to say to you, your interpretation of mm. be happy, never content, what's that mean to you? Be happy and never be content. Be happy, never content. Be happy with what you have, but don't be content. Be happy if you've got a million pounds in the bank. Yes, I'm thankful for that, but I'm not content. I'm not going to stop here. I'm going to strive for more and more and more. And that's how, and that's how I am in life. I like to feel this. I don't, com- I don't look at life and I don't compare myself to what this guy has or to what that guy has. Which is why I'm not really on my social media that much now, you know, no more. I don't want to see what car this guy has because I can't get that, that car yet. I might, yes, I probably can, but I'm more thinking about investing. So I can't get that car yet. So you know what? I don't want to arouse any jealousy, emotion. I'm just going to strive for more in life. I'm not content with what I've got, but you know what? I'm going to strive. I'm going to invest more. I want to get better every day in my field, in boxing and in life. Yeah. So I am happy with what I've got, but I'm not content with where I am. Yeah. Nice one, bro. Thank you very much for your time. It's been an honour. Thank you. Nice one. Cool.